Welcome back to my first time reading The Lord of the Rings. Wow, 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 wow. If you haven't checked out episode one, I will leave it up above. Just a brief reminder that there are spoilers. I don't know if I ever got done telling you everything that I thought of The Fellowship, which I gave this five stars. This was the only one out of the three that was a reread for me. So just so incredibly good. I don't remember where I left you off. I think the only parts that I really wanted to remark on were the ones in Lothlorien because it was just so good. I have a scratch on my nose because Mr. Houdini, um, Calcifer, got out of the apartment the other day and ran down the hallway like a psycho and I ran after him and I had to wrangle him back inside and I did pay for uh, my services. Hobbits are talking about how they see like no color in Lothlorien, but those that they know, gold and white and blue and green, but they were fresh and poignant as if he had at that moment first perceived them and made for them names new and wonderful. I feel as if I was inside a song, if you take my meaning. It's so sad because Frodo's errand with the ring, um, it's pretty well hypothesized that once he destroys the ring, then Lothlorien is gonna fall because Galadriel has one of the rings that was made long ago. People think that once the one ring is destroyed, like the power of all the other rings are also gonna diminish and it's Galadriel's power through wielding the ring that is making Lothlorien how beautiful and how magnificent and how just like i don't know i can't even say i don't know if it's my favorite location never before had he been so suddenly and so keenly aware of the feel and texture of a tree's skin and of the life within it he felt a delight in wood and the touch of it neither as forester nor as carpenter it was the delight of the living tree itself we have legolas and gimli becoming bffs so fun i love them the friendships the last chapter the breaking of the fellowship where a lot happens and frodo ultimately decides to leave the company behind because he sees what the ring is doing to boromir who obviously bites it bites the bullet he leaves because he doesn't want the ring to corrupt and change anyone else of the company and obviously we've had gandalf fall in moria and now we've had boromir die i am hurting everyone so i'm gonna go take this upon myself but obviously sam is like no you're not going without me of all the confounded nuisances you are the worst sam i was like i couldn't have borne it you all alone and without me to help you it would have been it would have been the death of me it would be the death of you to come with me sam said frodo and i could not have borne that not as certain as being left behind said sam but i'm going to mordor i know that well enough mr frodo of course you are and i'm coming with you Anyway, but that is like my final, I guess, update on The Fellowship. So far, it is my favorite book. I have also, I don't think I've been saying, but I've been watching the films in tandem after I finish each one. So I did watch Fellowship of the Ring. Love it, love it, love it, love it so, so much. And I think, I don't know, because I've always said that The Two Towers is my favorite film. And don't be mad at me, but did I start and finish The Two Towers without giving you one single update on my thoughts while reading? I did. But do not despair. I've been watching the movies in tandem and I really, really love The Fellowship. And I recently obviously finished the Two Towers book, watched the Two Towers film. I actually don't know anymore. Fellowship is still my favorite so far, although I haven't even started Return of the King yet. This is the one where, like with the Fellowship, I love the book and the film almost equally, I feel, because like I grew up watching the films first. They're very nostalgic for me, and I think they're really, really amazing, and I feel like I love the book and the film in equal measure. With the Two Towers, I don't know. This one is really, really tricky because the film changes a lot of things for this one and I think so many sections of the book are obviously so much better than the movie but also vice versa. I'm also not a fan of the way that the narrative is split because of course after Sam and Frodo have gone off in The Fellowship we basically get this two towers split in half like this is Aragorn 
Gimli and Legolas and then over here is Sam, Frodo and Gollum and of course if this was I feel like if this was a modern fantasy book it would be split chapter by chapter like switching back and forth perspectives but Tolkien just like split it down the middle so you have you don't have any breaks between the different perspectives like you're just stuck I mean, I didn't feel stuck with Aragorn and like listen Gimli, like that is where I wanted to be. But when it switches to Frodo and Sam, like if you ever get tired of their narrative or of their story, like you just have to keep trucking through it because you know that you're not gonna get a perspective switch until like much later, like hundreds of pages. You are just stuck plodding along on their journey, which I honestly preferred more in the book <laughs> because watching the film, The Two Towers, every time that it switched back to Sam and Frodo, I was like, oh good God. Or even to Merry and Pippin after they've gone with Treebeard, I was like, oh. It's just done so much better in the book, in my opinion, the sections with Sam and Frodo and the sections with the Ents, it's just so much more enjoyable to read about than to watch, especially because of the pacing difference. I love the scenes with Theoden and obviously Gandalf comes back and I was really kind of dreading because obviously I'd only seen the film for this one. This was my first time reading The Two Towers, but I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna like the Ent sections because like conceptually, and ideologically i love the ants i love their whole thing i want to know so much more about them i think they're some of the coolest parts of the lord of the rings watching the sections in the two towers i don't know if it's just me personally but i'm just always like trying hard to maintain focus and not fall asleep but in the book wow some of my favorite parts were with the end so i was very very happy about it so tree beard is just i just love the relationship with like language and nature and everything that tolkien dives into in the two towers with them tree beard is like i'm not going to tell you my full name to mary and pippin for one thing it would take a long while my name is growing all the time and i've lived a very long long time so my name is like a story real names tell you the story of the things they belong to in my language or even just like when mary and pippin are like oh go up that hill and tree bitters like hill yes that is the word but it is a hasty word for a thing that has stood here ever since this part of the world was shaped it is a hasty word i just love it gandalf uh comes back and he comes back sassier than ever so he goes to um rohan obviously with aragorn and gimli and legolas he is trying to break theoden out of the spell that he has been under the wise speak only of what they know grima a witless worm have you become therefore be silent and keep your forked tongue behind your teeth i have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a serving man till the lightning falls i have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a serving man yeah, that's right. And I also just love, love the fact that, get, first of all, Gimli, I don't know if I really said this, I guess not, but Gimli, ever since he saw Galadriel, has been smitten. It's so funny. It's so funny because, and it's just like so, it's so wholesome and it's so sweet, but he has basically taken it as his job as he travels throughout Middle Earth to defend Galadriel's good name from anyone who badmouths her. Like he's taken it upon himself to defend her in every capacity because Eomir, Eomir is like, um, he kind of shit talks Lothlorien and Galadriel and eventually they kind of make it up. But Gimli's like, if you ever chance to see the lady Galadriel with your eyes, then you shall acknowledge her the fairest of ladies or our friendship will end. Okay, and then we have Gandalf and Saruman duking it out with words because um of course isengard has been uh eisen bombarded isengard has been kind of taken over by the ents and mary and pippin are there and it's so fun so fun the way that saruman is out here you know trying to get people onto his side and he's like oh i'm just an old man how dare you how dare you be so mean to me everyone's kind of worried that theoden is gonna fall under his spell as well but it doesn't work because theoden is back you hold out your hand to me and i perceive only a finger of the claw of mordor when you hang from a gibbet at your window gibbet is it gibbet or gibbet for the sport of your own crows i will have peace with you and orthanc 
A lesser son of great sires am I, but I do not need to lick your fingers. Turn else wither. But I fear your voice has lost its charm. I fear your voice has lost its charm. It's the great roast of Saruman the Great. Saruman is like to Gandalf, we should understand one another. And Gandalf is like, understand one another. I fear I am beyond your comprehension. Charge this really quickly and then we're finally gonna start Return of the King. This is the only one that I have not started. And I'm just so sad that I'm here because I just, I don't want it to be over, but I'm very excited to finally read this. And yeah, so this was five stars. If I didn't say, I gave both of them five stars. I forgot how Return of the King opens. I forgot how Return of the King opens. Do you remember? Do you remember? Schmaggle, Schmaggle. You kind of look like Gollum, actually. Let me just. Yeah, that's a that's Gollum actually right there. I am sick, but I wanted to update this anyway, so please just bear with my voice. So I have been having some thoughts just while I've been like reading a little bit and getting into the Two Towers and watching the films as well. I am like confused and I honestly keep having questions that I keep pushing to the back of my mind concerning everything. I'm gonna assume because there's so much lore and information out there i'm gonna assume that tolkien wrote about it in some capacity somewhere and so one of you knows the answer but number one why why is sauron evil why is he the way that he is why does he want to take over middle earth like i know his not his backstory but i know like where he came from and what he was before fellowship started and everything like that just in context of the lord of the rings novels book sorry i don't really get his motivation and i know that a lot of fantasy books and a lot of fantasy from this time period is just very much like good and evil and it's just good and evil because it's good and evil and that's all it is and i'm not saying that like frodo and his companions and everyone fighting against sauron i'm not saying that they're like wholly good but i feel like the evil powers in the lord of the rings are just wholly evil for the sake of being wholly evil except for Gollum, of course because there is a ton of exploration with that character but in terms of sauron I'm just a little bit like, okay, why is he doing what he's doing? The second thing, if we're staying on the Sauron topic, is I don't get this eyeball thing. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I have never got- I just never understood the whole eyeball in the tower thing. Why is there an eyeball in the tower? Like, is no one- is, has anyone asked these questions before? They must have. I'm just- I'm just confused about the whole how did Sauron go from, you know, getting vanquished by Isildur and then he kind of propped himself back up to be this fiery eye in the tower. And of course that's just like the film's concept of it because in the books, like he is kind of just alluded to as this eye that sees everything. But in the books, I'm thinking it might be more metaphorical and like he he is a body. I'm just confused, honestly confused. And I've never understood the power of the eye like i guess he has a voice i'm just not very clear cut on all of the ins and outs of how there is an eye in the tower basically that kind of means or how he got up there or who put him there or like what kind of power he has really because in the novel like of course it's most people just doing his bidding and then this brings me to my third and probably final big question why do the people who join sauron join sauron like we get a pretty in-depth look into all the different kinds of beings that join the dark forces and join the dark army. Like obviously the goblins and the orcs and the urukai. The urukai understand, right? Because they're like created for that purpose. Stuff like, let's just start with the orcs. That's, that's the biggest one. That's the one that we know. You know, those are Sauron's baddies. Why did they join Sauron? When did they join Sauron? Are they getting paid? Did they have unions? What is going on? I'm just confused. Like, what is their end goal here? Were men treating them badly? Because then I would understand the orcs 
wanting men to be wiped out and obviously it seems like orcs and men have been mortal enemies for a while but i just feel like because that info isn't in the three sections of the lord of the rings i'm just a little bit like okay like orcs are evil but i'm like why are they evil why do they want to take over and burn the whole world just because they want to take over and burn the whole world is it because of the food chain like are men in their diet is that their primary diet i just have questions can i answer any of them i appreciate you so much or the goblins um yeah i'm just wondering why the dark creatures that join sauron why do they join him and how did he even get the messages out to them in the first place i'm just having trouble i'm someone who like i need to know like the logistics and the reasons and like be able to conceptualize kind of everything that's happening uh not physical nature of sauron and also the fact that I don't really know who he is, what he is, the fact that he is kind of an idea and is invisible just doesn't, doesn't gel with me. <laughs> Am I sitting here laughing at this so hard? <laughs> it is a little bit late for now. I have made some, ooh, she's hot, tea. It is lemon echinacea. Let's sit down and talk about Gollum. Can we talk about Gollum? I love this being. I love this being so much. I love Gollum. I think he's a freaking cutie. Book four of the two towers because I'm still on talking about the two towers. I can't stop. We get to know Schmeagol and I just love him to bits and pieces. I think the relationship between Frodo and Gollum is one of the most fascinating things. I think they are so important for each other. They understand each other. As Tolkien writes, the two were in some way akin and not alien. They could reach one another's minds, which is just so touching and so heartbreaking because obviously both Frodo and Gollum and only Frodo and Gollum and Bilbo for that matter, like they're all connected, but only Frodo and Gollum are on the quest. And it's really just those two who know what the other one is going through. And Frodo obviously sees in Gollum what he himself could become, what Bilbo could have become. So Sam was kind of left out of that whole understanding and world of Frodo that he wants to know so desperately because he loves Frodo so desperately. Can I just say, so weird, there were a couple angry gentlemen on, well they weren't really that gentle, the last Lord of the Rings video who were so upset and offended that I said that Sam loves Frodo or like that Sam and Frodo love each other because they took it obviously that I meant like romantically and first of all, why not? Second of all, you can love, you can love people. You can just love people. News flash. Oh my God. You can just love people. Um, you don't have to love them romantically. You can love them platonically. I think soulmates can be any kind of people. And it was just like a little weird because like they love each other, man. Have you seen a stronger bond in fiction? Sam and Frodo's relationship is beautiful no matter what you want to characterize it as, no matter what Tolkien wanted to characterize it as, just the love, the pure love and loyalty and honor and respect that they have for each other is so touching no matter what context it's in. And Sam in this one just straight up says, I love him. Like, I love him. I love Frodo so much. So just a little weird, like, cool your jets, gentlemen, cool your jets. But back to Gollum. I love Gollum and I feel so sorry for him. I think really... The theme that I have, the characters that I love the most, I just like feel so much pity for. I really just feel so much pity for it. The amount of times in The Two Towers that Tolkien refers to Gollum as a dog, he just calls him like Frodo's dog and they're like having this pet along for the journey with them because that's kind of what Gollum has become. He took a few steps away and looked back inquiringly like a dog inviting them for a walk. I will say in The Two Towers and especially going into The Return of the King, the films pisses me off. Sam pisses me off in the films and thankfully what happens in the films with the three of them, the trio, is not what is faithful to the books because Sam in the films, I, you know, you get, I get upset with Sam and I really don't empathize with him or sympathize with him, whatever, um, and his stance on Gollum um, because I mean yeah he is right about Gollum he's a conniving sneaky little mongrel but he's also Smeagol and he's also this kind-hearted 
little creature who has been through so much and just wants connection and wants wants to be brought back oh wants to be brought back Gollum watched every morsel from hand to mouth like an expectant dog by a diner's chair so obviously in the film they really capitalize on sam's jealousy of Gollum and of the understanding they have but in the books at least so far and the amounts that i am into in return of the king that's not really a huge thing um like it is in the films which thank goodness this is the passage that almost brought me to tears um it's sam sam just watching frodo as frodo sleeps i can't believe we actually get these passages um as he had kept watch sam had noticed that at times a light seemed to be shining faintly within but now the light was even clearer and stronger frodo's face was peaceful the marks of fear and care had left it but it looked old old and beautiful as if the chiseling of the shaping years was now revealed in many fine lines that had before been hidden, though the identity of the face was not changed. Not that Sam Gamgee put it that way to himself. He shook his head as if finding words useless and murmured, I love him. He's like that, and sometimes it shines through somehow, but I love him whether or no. And it's so sad because on the next page, Gollum like walks into the scene and he sees sam watching frodo with so much love and reverence and respect being like i love him and Gollum is like oh, i'm so left out i'm so not in that circle yes i can understand frodo but i've become something that is not i've fallen too far i can't get back into the reaches of love and light and friendship and goodness and it's just so heartbreaking and then i have i talked about this character we meet faramir um faramir has been one of my favorite characters in lord of the rings even before i started reading the books but book faramir is so different because of course i'm coming to the books with only film knowledge and faramir's character in the books is just like faramir in the films times a thousand in terms of like chivalry goodness the desire just to be an all-around stand-up person for no other reason than just like he doesn't want to cause harm he doesn't even let his men like go hunting to kill animals or anything like that someone commented that like yes in the films they had to make faramir more of an obstacle to frodo because in the books faramir's just like come along frodo young lad like i'm gonna respect you your autonomy totally and i'm gonna be the person that boromir couldn't be for you but in the films faramir's like <laughs> this like strangely evil robin hood at first and then of course we have the ending of two towers which is just has some of the most beautiful passages uh known to humankind is the part where sam talks sam talks about being in a story frodo wouldn't have got far without sam what he did now mr frodo you shouldn't make fun i was serious so was i Gollum is hearing all this touching stuff that sam is saying to frodo about him being the hero and about their story together and then he starts talking about Gollum, and he says i wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain Gollum." <laughs> Gollum, he called, would you like to be the hero? Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes and they went dim and gray, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him and he turned away, peering back upwards, shaking his head. Okay, I don't know about you, but like we've had obviously the scene in the book where Frodo has to go down to the secret pool where Gollum is singing his little fish songs and trick Gollum into coming back up so that Faramir and his men can kind of capture Gollum and interrogate him. In the film, it's a bit more like we're going to beat you up for answers and stuff. In the book, it's a little bit more gentle, but regardless, in both cases, Frodo still has to kind of lie to Gollum. And up until this point, Schmeagol has really been the one coming out and softening and like really kind of respecting Frodo and thinking of him as his master and just like building a rapport and trust and in the film you really see the Gollum side kind of subsiding and Smeagol is like oh my gosh I'm getting free of you like I'm getting free of this awful part inside of me that hates myself and berates myself slowly learning to trust and not to feel any pain or suffering but then when Frodo comes down and says hey follow me it's all gonna be okay when in fact it is not all okay and he's about to be taken captive by the men of gondor it's just like actually heartbreaking and it is maybe one of the moments in the film that frustrates me the most because it's just like oh man you've worked so hard and all of a sudden just to see the look 
on his face when he realized he's been a bit betrayed and tricked and lied to and you see that like instant defense mechanism take over and Gollum come back it's just like I can't like I physically can't I don't want to read these books anymore because they make me feel too much and it's just one of the saddest parts in the book honestly because that's the moment that he just snaps and he's like okay I'm gonna take you to the big spider lady if we can finally get to this book this is the one that uh the films I think go the most off script definitely not my favorite so far like currently I would rank them Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King although I know like I know they're just Lord of the Rings in totality but because they're split like this I can tell you obviously just which sections of the story I prefer more I just feel like it's a little bit weirdly paced I think for me but I do love the sections with Gandalf because in Return of the King Gandalf takes Pippin and they go to Minas Tirith and they kind of just put up with the Denethor's shit who's Faramir's father and Boromir's father. The Two Towers ends with Sam thinking Frodo is dead and then right at the end learning he's alive because he's been stung by Shelob and then he's been taken by orcs when Return of the King starts, we flash back to Gondor. And then the other sections that I've been liking are Denethor's whole just like losing it, going crazy because he has lost hope. We learn that Sauron has kind of gotten into his head via the Palantirs, so the, the orbs of communication, and he's just lost hope because he's been fed just hopelessness. And eventually when he sends Faramir into a pointless battle, Faramir returns pretty wounded. Denethor is like, you know what? I've lost Bormir. I'm losing Faramir. It's just time to light it up, baby. And he just has great lines, honestly, even though like you hate him. If Doom, if Doom denies this to me, then I will have not. I will have nothing. Neither life diminished, nor love halved, nor honor abated. Um, but yeah, reading the books, I think I get a lot more a sense of the really cool parallels that are going on with the kingdoms of like Gondor and Rohan because obviously you have the king or just whoever's ruling over them, right? You have Theoden and Denethor, even though Denethor is just technically a steward of Gondor, but you have both of them confronting Sauron and so you kind of get both of the, I guess, bigger kingdoms of men acting to evil and you have one who is pure hopelessness and who just wants to off himself because he is so not full of hope and then you have Theoden who rides into battle has hope until the very end and makes like a last stand my voice is really going like more tea and it's just great and then of course you have the offspring of Theoden and Denethor uh well not really, but like Eowyn is like his daughter, even though she's not his biological daughter. And then you have Faramir and eventually like they meet and come together and I think kind of work to heal what has been lost between the two kingdoms, which is just great. I am 872 pages in to The Lord of the Rings. I'm on chapter nine, The Last Debate. So I'm gonna go read some more. This has been a pretty lengthy update, but just, just loving it. It has been done. It has been done. Not the book. Oh my god, I'm not on the book yet. The ring has been yeeted into the <laughs> cracks of doom. I'm finishing this this morning, today, if it kills me. Like, I just need to finish this. Um, So, right, where were we? Okay, so Frodo did it, but let me just say the lead up to, obviously, like, Frodo and Sam, and they leave Gollum behind and all of that stuff, but Sam is trying to be like, hey, do you remember this part of our journey or this part of our journey? And Frodo was like, no, I'm afraid not, Sam. At least I know that such things happened, but I cannot see them. No taste of food, no feel of water, no sound of wind, no memory of tree or grass or flower, no image of moon or star are left to me. I am naked in the dark, Sam, and there is no veil between me and the wheel of fire. Final chapters, though, before... I mean, even after they throw the ring in the fire, I was just thinking a lot and I was a little, not like disappointed, but just, I don't, I don't know. I wanted more of Frodo because actually a lot of the chapters 
switch to focusing on Sam, which is fair. Sam is such a hero. He literally carries Frodo. <laughs> he literally carries the quest on his back, but so much of like the reactions to what is happening, the description, and later on when they do throw the ring into Mount Doom, like their reactions to being saved by the eagles, um, seeing Gandalf is alive again, is all focused on Sam and kind of Sam's reaction. And I just wanted a little bit more of Frodo. I don't know if it's because Frodo has, like he's faded so much into the wounds that he's received along the quest, but just, I don't know, I wanted a little bit more of Frodo in there. Gollum comes comes back and he tries to take the ring from Frodo, and of course at the end, Frodo like fails, I guess, and he can't throw the ring in, and then obviously it's Gollum who finally snatches it and falls down into the lava, the cracks, whatever. And all that ruin of the world for the moment, he felt only joy, great joy, Sam does. Um, and then Frodo's like, I'm glad you are, sorry. Oh. What I do also really love is that of course after like the battles have been fought and the ring has been thrown in the fire, it doesn't just end. Like I love, I love getting all of the perspectives of like everyone literally making the return journey home. I love the reunions and we have like Faramir and Eowyn's little romance and I just love all of that because those were the elements that I really enjoyed in the fellowship was just like the walking around without knowing how bad things really were. So I just love that we get so much at the end of this of like Legolas and Gimli and their little tiny adventures and Aragorn being king like you actually get to see a good deal of that and the hobbits and Gandalf and I just I love all of it and these are the parts of Return of the King that I'm now enjoying the most is after like kind of like the main parts of the quest is over I guess the goal has been finished they finally start to make their way back to the Shire after spending quite a while in Gondor a little bit in Rivendell we see Bilbo again who like now everything is fading because the ring has been destroyed and I think that's a lot of what I would like to see as well is like how the world is changing and like what Galadriel was saying in Fellowship. But anyway, um, then we have Frodo coming back to the Shire and it's just like, no, no, it just hurts so bad because he tells Gandalf, there is no real going back. Though I may come to the Shire, it will not seem the same for I shall not be the same. I am wounded with knife, sting and tooth and a long burden. Where shall I find rest? Gandalf did not answer. Anyway, so I'm now on the last two chapters of Return of the King. I am on chapter eight, The Scouring of the Shire. And I swear to God, if anything has happened to the Shire while we've been away, if anything has changed, if anyone is making mischief, Saruman, I'm looking at you. I'm gonna be upset. Like I'm legitimately gonna be upset if any single blade of grass in the Shire has been touched because I don't know, I haven't read this. Obviously the film ends and the Shire is fine. But the chapter is called The Scouring of the Shire, so that doesn't sound that doesn't sound great. Let's finish Return of the King. Stop. Stop right there. What do you mean? What do you mean new houses had been built? Two storied? Two story houses in the Shire? Not the land development, not the land development. With narrow straight sided windows, bare and dimly lit, all very gloomy and unshire like. Saruman has gone to the Shire and he's crashing the housing market. Oh my god, Bill Fernie. Oh, also Sam gets Bill back. Sam gets Bill back. Okay, I just, mm, I don't know if I'm like a fan of honestly where this is going because first, I think just in my bones, I'm just so upset the Shire has been touched in any capacity. Like we just got to a part where so many houses and places are burned down. Someone just told Sam that they dug up Bagshot Row. We're just like, no, like this is such a weird conclusion. Like I feel like we just had so many battles. We just had so many high points of the novel and I feel like 
it's just so weird because now we have an army of hobbits trying to um, make the ruffians and the men and all the people who have taken over the Shire leave and they literally just killed someone <laughs> in the Shire which like never happens and I'm just I'm just so upset and I don't like this I don't like it I don't like the scouring of the Shire obviously I know that things couldn't have just stayed the same when they all left for so long but um it's just mm -mm, mm -mm. I really prefer it in the films when Saruman dies when he dies in the film, um, in the extended version, at least. I wish it wasn't a thing. I wish it wasn't a thing at all because I don't want the Shire to be touched at all. It just seems like such a sad thing for Frodo because he's been through so much and like, they were so excited to come back and now it's so different. I'm gonna finish this chapter and then I only have one more, but I'm just upset. Not the taters, they ruined his taters. What do you mean? Okay, so they cleared people out. 19 hobbits died. It's just not right. It's just not right. I'm gonna pretend none of this happened. Honestly, when I finish the book, I'm gonna pretend this chapter never happened. They go to Bag End. It was one of the saddest hours in their lives. Me too. Me too. The great chimney rose up before them, and as they drew near the old village across the water, through rows of new mean houses along each side of the road, they saw the new mill in all its frowning and dirty ugliness. A great brick building straddling the stream, which it fouled with a steaming and stinking outflow. All along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. All the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were broken. Great wagons were standing in disorder in a field beaten bare of grass. They cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree had stood under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this was the last straw, Sam burst into tears. It's my last straw. I'm so upset. I'm actually so upset. This is not right. Who, Tolkien, why would you do this? Like I said, I'm just literally gonna pretend. Literally gonna pretend this didn't happen. I have two pages left of Return of the King. I am on the final chapter um, and it's so upsetting because obviously they kind of set the Shire to rights. Sam gets married. Frodo asks Sam to move in with him. And then I think it's only a year that goes by but Frodo starts to like obviously still feel so much wounding from everything that has happened to him. And one day he asks Sam, Oh man, it's just so upsetting. You know when a character asks like their best friend or whoever it is to go on like a walk with them? It's never good. Never good when they're like, hey, you want to go for a walk? And deep down, you know, it's their last walk. I'm just upset. Um, and Sam's like, yeah, I want to come with you. I wish I could go all the way to Rivendell, but I'm torn in two because like his wife is there now. Sam's had a baby. And Frodo's like, poor Sam. It will feel like that, I am afraid but you will be healed. You were meant to be solid and whole, and you will be. You were meant to be solid and whole, and Frodo was not. I'm just gonna finish up because I can't keep killing myself like this, okay. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. But you are my heir. All that I had and might have had, I leave to you. Oh, I actually got goosebumps. I can't believe I finished all 
all of it, I feel heartbreaking, but perfect ending, honestly. Um, I did start reading the appendix. I, here's the thing. I started it, I got a little bit of the ways into it, so basically this whole thing is the appendices, but I'm really interested in reading everything else now <laughs> from Tolkien and really interested in reading the Silmarillion as well. So should I be reading the appendix if I'm just going to read the Silmarillion and everything else that he has written concerning Middle Earth? Because I'm just like, is this going to repeat stuff that's in the Silmarillion or I just I don't really know how it works if I'm being honest so let me know if you know that would be greatly appreciated just how they all look together I think they look so pretty final thoughts not final thoughts here because Carolyn will be having a video on her channel at Carolyn Murray Reads I'll leave her in the description box of our chat of this which I'm so excited for but so sad that it's over um fellowship was my favorite Fellowship was my absolute favorite, although I really liked the end of Return of the King. Really not a fan of what he chose to do with the Shire because I just think like it wasn't necessary, I feel. I don't know. I don't know. And then obviously the end, like the last few chapters. Oh my god, so upsetting. The last paragraph, the last sentence. Wow. Just like perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, the only thing in Return of the King is that I was expecting this to focus a lot more on Frodo than it did, but it really shines a light on Sam the most, especially at the end, especially in the last little bit as well. And I just, yeah, I love Sam, but I love Frodo, I think, even a little bit more. I wish he had, would have had a chance to say a few more things and we would have seen a little bit more of what he was feeling. Fellowship holds the most special place in my heart. And now going back and like reading the Tom Bombadil chapter um that's that is hurting can't believe it's over i can't believe it's over every book that we read for game of tomes you just end up spending so long with that book and you form such relationship with that book and this one has been no different and i just mm, just hurts a little bit i'm actually not done watching return of the king the film so i think tonight i will try to watch the last hour of that or so that i have left because it's a very long movie but i think i would honestly rank my enjoyment of like three if we're doing it that way fellowship then two towers and finally return of the king thank you for coming along with me on this journey sam and frodo forever and ever and ever thank you for watching thank you for hanging out ciao